Um, so I have tried to update the talk um, just as with COVID. Um, I think we're all learning and every day there's new information, um, especially as the, the outbreak moves on. Um, so I've tried to make it as up to date as possible, um, but um, you know, tomorrow there may be new things. Um, so um, let me address the then and now of monkeypox. I'm gonna start with uh, smallpox and uh, monkeypox is uh, um, an orthopox virus, same group as uh, monkeypox. And um, I think those of us um, of a certain age were vaccinated against smallpox. Um, vaccine efficacy, uh, immunicity has waned, uh, immunity has waned. And those born after the 1970s um, were not vaccinated. Um, this includes those in, uh, in Africa where um, monkeypox is endemic. So I think the differences between smallpox and monkeypox in terms of control and response is that uh, for smallpox, there's no animal reservoir. It's just person, to, it was person to person transmission. There was an excellent smallpox vaccine and intense um, vaccine campaigns, including ring vaccinations um, led to the eradication of smallpox, meaning there's none in the world occurring naturally um, in 1974. And that's Ali, who was the last patient. He was a cook in Somalia. Very sadly, Ali was assisting with polio campaigns uh, in Africa and died of malaria. But um, uh, the vaccine that was developed for um, smallpox, um, two stocks were kept, one in the United States, and one in Russia, all other material was destroyed. Um, and for some countries, smallpox vaccine continued to be administered um, because of the concerns about germ warfare. Um, so they were administered to some healthcare workers, some laboratory workers, and then um, people going to combat in certain parts of the world. So the vaccine was one that many of us did receive. It was a live attenuated, Vaccinia virus, which is one of the vaccine, the um, viruses in the same orthopox group, had a lot of adverse reactions, um, and uh, it's still available. It was a global stockpile kept, but um, we'll discuss later what its role is currently. So, uh, on the twenty third of July, following quite a rapid expansion of the current. Uh, monkeypox outbreak in non-endemic uh, areas um, amongst a specific group of people predominantly, the Director General decided to um, raise the level of response to the highest um, uh, alert, declaring that he um, declared the um, unprecedented global outbreak of monkeypox a public health emergency of international concern. So it did follow two meetings of uh, emergency committees, according to the international health regulations, there was no consensus. But I think based on the fact that this was an unusual or unexpected event, this was uh, a really large and um, enlarging outbreak in a new population outside of endemic areas, um, had had already spread internationally at the time of the declaration and really did require a coordinated response with uh, a careful attention to, to countermeasures. So although it's not easily transmitted, um, uh, I think all these concerns were raised and um, the fake criteria, which are you know, quite easy to tick, to be honest, having been involved in quite a number of uh, these meetings uh, were met. The risk assessment uh, at globally was considered moderate, but particularly high uh, risk in the European region including the United States. So how did this all start? Well, from time to time, there are cases of monkeypox imported from endemic areas. The UK has um, one or two a year, uh, people going to visit Nigeria. Uh, they identify these days quite quickly. They have a high level laboratory. They do respond by isolating the cases, following up um, family contacts. Um, and they, they haven't really been outbreaks. I think there've been one or two cases in, um, in families in the same uh, household. 
So the first case in the UK, and it was presented in kind of the uh, uh, Public Health England's uh, UK um, meetings, was uh, somebody who'd recently traveled to, to Nigeria, um, and that seemed to be contained. But on May the 16th, there were four other cases confirmed, didn't have a link to this first one. Um, and uh, quite rapidly after that, uh, cases were seen in a number of countries. And um, by the 2nd of August, there were more than 25,000 cases. It's probably an underestimate in 83 countries total. This includes the endemic country, the non-endemic, um, they've kind of merged them, but the majority of the cases were in non-endemic countries, so outside of the usual ones in Africa. Um, I think from various investigations, particularly molecular work and sequencing, it's likely that uh, the cases were already noted outside of the endemic area and circulating somewhere in April. So I think the timing coincided with um, uh, restrictions for COVID being um, taken, um, being withdrawn, people going to a lot of social events, there were many pride events, um, and uh, uh, there's obviously a link with uh, people now socializing again. So in the last week, um, most of the cases um, have in fact been seen in the United States, and uh, two of the states declared um, public health emergencies. And uh, this morning, in fact, the United States uh, declared um, monkeypox uh, a health emergency. And I think this is really to uh, free up funds and to increase access to testing and uh, increase the production and distribution um, of vaccines and possibly drugs uh, to respond to this uh, um, expanding outbreak and try and bring it under control. So I think we'll have to watch the space. But no, um, no word about access to these countermeasures um, for Africa. So a little bit about orthopox viruses. And uh, just as the Flavi virus people, uh, virologists had their day, and then the respiratory coronavirus people had their day, it's now the uh, pox virus. Uh, people who've been laboring away for a very long time. And uh, it's interesting to see and speak to, to many of these. So orthopox virus is quite a big group, DNA virus. Um, it's a zoonosis. It's endemic in West and Central Africa. Um, the name came from laboratory monkeys, in imported laboratory monkeys in, um, in Denmark, in Copenhagen, uh, when they noticed these skin lesions and identified uh, this virus. So 1958 um, kind of preceded the first human case identified, may well have occurred before, in 1970s, in 1970 in a child in the Congo Basin. Uh, there was a very interesting outbreak in the United States. There's been an outbreak in Singapore, one in Israel. Um, and I'll mention a little bit more about the uh, outbreak in the United States. And it really speaks to the international um, animal trade. Um, for most infections, the source is unknown, but uh, it's generally contact, to, contact with uh, various animals in these tropical rainforests, um, and most of the cases are identified in people living on the fringes of the tropical rainforests in a number of countries in West and um, Central Africa, DRC, Nigeria, a couple of others. More recently, the outbreak has actually expanded in terms of geographical distribution um, and also quite a significant increase in numbers since the beginning of this year. So the animal reservoir is unknown, um, but it's likely that African rodents play a role and then um, they infect other small mammals and people who are going to hunt um, and slaughter um, a number of these generally for food or for selling uh, may well be exposed. In these areas, um, the um, uh, population affected is very different to what we're seeing now. Uh, it's women who tend to people who are sick, it's men who may go hunting in the forest, and there's um, a number of children who've been infected. So there are two different clades. I'm sure you've heard quite a lot about this. Um, 
There's the Central African clade, which has about a 10% mortality, the West African clade, which has about a 1% mortality, and uh, the current outbreak is most related to the West African um, outbreak, although there are some uh, genetic differences. So mostly mild, mostly self-limiting, and I think there is an underestimate of cases. These patients occur in remote areas, access to testing is extremely limited, and um, many patients have mild illness and uh, most get better. Um, complications include secondary infection in the lesions leading to septicemia, pneumonia, fluid loss, uh, myocarditis has been documented, and importantly, encephalitis, which is also being seen in the current outbreak. Um, no therapeutics, no vaccines, and now with the um, uh, focus on um, increasing countermeasures like vaccines and antiviral drugs, um, this has to raise the issue around equity and access of um, populations in endemic areas uh, to vaccines and to anti-treatment. So just a little bit about uh, monkeypox in animals. I think I'm putting on my animal hat. Um, still learning a lot about it. Can infect a wide range of mammal species, uh, non-human primates, uh, prairie dogs, which are not dogs. They're actually quite cute rodents that people adopt as pets uh, when they're imported into particularly the United States. A number of squirrels. Um, uh, Gambian pouched rats, which are very clever animals. They are the ones used for sniffing out drugs and sniffing out TB and a number of shrews. Um, the spectrum of illness is very variable. I think in the rodents, it's mostly asymptomatic, but clearly in the non-human primates, you get lesions that are um, uh, quite similar in some cases and a lot more severe in others to those seen in humans, cough, loss of appetite. Um, uh, they can transmit to other animals and then obviously to humans. There have been no reports, though, of humans transmitting uh, monkeypox to animals, but, you know, time will tell. I think with COVID, we, we did see the reverse transmission. So this is the interesting outbreak. Um, there was um, a large shipment of uh, mostly Gambian pouch rats and a whole lot of other um, rodents and uh, tree squirrels and rope squirrels and um, bushy brush-tailed porcupines. Uh, in fact, I think it was a shipment of 762. Yeah, that's just uh, gives you, a, you know, an idea of uh, animals leaving the continent. This is just one shipment. 762 rodents were shipped from Accra in Ghana to a distributor in Texas. The distributor in Texas then distributed to about six states in, um, in the Midwest in the United States. And in Illinois, the, um, the uh, person who received um, his shipment, he housed them next to a prairie dog enclosure. I think of about 200 prairie dogs. And prairie dogs are quite valued as household pets. They're very cute um, and uh, people buy them for their children. And many of those, I think uh, almost half of the 200, in fact, became infected with um, monkeypox. <coughs> he then transferred these, he shipped these, <coughs> sorry, just the frog in the throat. He shipped these um, infected, now I infected, but asymptomatic uh, prairie dogs to a whole lot of pet shops. And a uh, family in Wisconsin uh, bought one. Their three-year-old child was bitten by one of the prairie dogs. He developed an illness characterized by fever, swollen eyes, and a red vesicular rash. Um, child's parents also developed a rash. The phys physician was very good. He um, associated the, <clears throat> the, the illness in the child with uh, the bite from the prairie dog. Specimens were taken and monkeypox was identified. So the child and parents made an uneventful recovery, uh, investigation, um, uh, an investigation into the outbreak uh, was initiated, I think the CDC were involved. And in fact, in the period from May to June, 71 people with quite a wide range of um, ages were infected. There, there were no deaths, 
Um, but after that, the importing of um, certain animals from uh, Africa were, were stopped, but we know there's a, there's a very big illegal um, a trade in these animals. So what about monkeypox um, traditional in, in the African rainforests in Western Central Africa? Generally, there's um, an incubation period, which is very variable from three days to about, um, I don't know, 20 days, average about eight. Um, there's a prodrome, uh, flu-like illness. Uh, lymphadenopathy is very common, cervical, occipital. Um, and then most patients actually develop a rash, uh, usually about two days, but with quite a wide range from the prodrome to the rash. It's centrifugal, which means it's mostly on, on the peripheries, on the limbs, sometimes on the face. And typically it's not painful and it's not itchy. So just note those clinical features when I tell you about the differential diagnosis of the specimens we are receiving. The um, macules uh, develop into vesicles, which develop into pustules, there's crusting, there's umbilication, desquamation, the scabs fall off. And then uh, there's regrowth of skin. Often there's um, scarring. But importantly, the lesions are at the same stage um, of development. So there's synchronous development of, um, of the rash. So what about the current outbreak? So, you know, there's, there's a, a number of, of reports and uh, I think they're coming out uh, quite regularly now. This is one of the largest. It was um, almost the first. It's um, from the ShareNet Clinical Group, 43 sites in 43 countries. They looked at 520 infections. Um, uh, you know, it may be an underestimate. There may, you know, be a bit of bias um, in, in what's been reported. Um, but importantly, um, specific group that was most at risk were identified. 98% were um, gay or bisexual, 41% had HIV, and I'm quoting directly from the, the report, um, 38 years old, sexual activity was the most likely route. Uh, many had um, multiple partners and some had reported attendance at these large mass gatherings. Uh, many of them were pride events. Um, majority had a rash and the rash was very different to um, that's seen in the traditional monkeypox, in many cases, the majority had anogenital lesions rather than lesions on the, uh, the limbs and the face. And I think very importantly, 54 had only a single lesion. And um, if you want to use identifying cases and isolation as your mode of control, um, that one lesion may not always be vi uh, visible. Prodrome was present in most, and some it came before the lesions, some it came afterwards. Incubation periods were very variable. 13% um, required hospitalization. In this group, there were no deaths, and the reason for hospitalization was pain, mainly related to uh, proctitis, rectal lesions, um, dehydration, inability to feed if there were oral lesions, and um, I think there was myocarditis and um, I think there was an odd case of encephalitis. That's what the lesions look like. Um, uh, most have um, lymphadenopathy, um, but the lesions are not always typically synchronous in their development. So you may see in some patients uh, asynchronous, um, so different lesions in the same patient uh, at different stages um, all at once. So, these were the um, uh, uh, summary of, of some of the um, updated information. Uh, hospitalization I've mentioned, um, uh, complications are being reported, and most recently, and we don't have all the details, there have been three, and I think there's a fourth death now, um, three with encephalitis uh, and one with comorbidity and underlying lymphoma. There have been a number of healthcare workers infected. The majority, and we don't have all the details, um, acquired infection in the community. Uh, there have been a few women. There have certainly been a few children. The mode of transmission in the children hasn't been confirmed. Some of them were in a household where there was um, infection in, in adults, um, and it may be through 
to fomites. You may find the virus in skin scales that are shed. So shared bedding uh, might be a mode of transmission or, or towels or just being in the same room. Don't have any details on the women. And um, I'm sure this is a, a growing area that we'll, we'll, we'll learn about. So I think it's important to note that um, monkeypox can affect anybody. Um, that it's in a specific group relates to sexual and social networks and that the start of the outbreaks were probably these uh, mass gatherings, the pride events, uh, mostly in Europe. And the uh, majority of cases are in Europe and in the United States, um, I think Spain, Netherlands, Portugal, UK, USA, and maybe one or two others having the majority of cases. So what's happening in South Africa? Um, we've had a long established um, laboratory capacity for pox viruses in the Center for Emerging and Zoonotic and Parasitic Diseases. Um, so we're using an orthopox PCR um, and we've been doing testing in fact, since um, the, uh, the first cases were identified. To date, we've had three laboratory confirmed cases. Two um, did not give a history of travel. One was a tourist who was visiting from Switzerland and he um, in fact was infected and already had lesions before he came. All have made an uneventful recovery, all had mild illness. Um, where possible, contacts were followed up for, for illness and, and none were identified as having monkeypox. Um, we've had loads and loads of requests for testing and in the differential diagnosis, um, I will discuss some of them. Uh, we've sequenced and it's the West African clade, although there are some differences with, with the original one. Private labs are now starting to test. Um, they're doing it as part of an STI workup. Um, and I think it's important in all cases to consider uh, usual STIs in these patients. Quite a lot in that group that I mentioned had uh, different uh, uh, STIs and important also to do HIV testing. Um, we've been overwhelmed. Um, I think people who formerly knew how to, previously knew how to make a diagnosis, particularly of chickenpox, um, uh, are not doing so um, easily now, and they're raising the possibility of monkeypox. There are typical chickenpox cases, and when you review the clinical presentation, and we try and get pictures um, discreetly, of course, confidentially, um, on all submissions, we look at the clinical presentation, we look at the um, epidemiology, the likelihood of this being something else, um, or monkeypox, um, and then either test or don't test. We're testing for a large part of Africa, um, particularly Southern Africa and East Africa, um, much harder to get histories, but in the ones that we have um, obtained <laughs> and pictures, they've been chickenpox or even in Pataigo and we've not had any uh, positive cases. Um, at the moment, uh, the minister has confirmed that it is a notifiable disease, but we await the gazetting. Um, and so, you know, that's where we are at the moment. We don't have any drugs for treating monkeypox. We don't have any vaccines. Fortunately, we haven't required any, and it's um, really um, supportive care which might include analgesia for some cases, but not the ones that we've had, and then contact follow-up um, as, as required. Uh, we've used an um, infectious disease group to review cases, uh, as well as some dermatologists, and they've really offered a fantastic service. Very quick turnaround of decisions around testing. Just remember, if you do decide to test, you label the patient as having monkeypox, it um, requires the patient to be isolated, for contacts to start being identified and, and, and followed up. And it creates a lot of panic and anxiety in families and patients. So my advice is to think very carefully, um, consider the differentials and discuss before testing. So uh, credit to my colleague, Jeremy Null, who's um, infectious disease head in Johannesburg at the Helen Joseph 
Um, he's provided this, this and following slides looking at uh, the very broad differential diagnosis, infectious, non-infectious, um, mostly revolving around uh, um, infections or non-infectious non issue uh, things, but the infectious ones uh, really focusing on those uh, with vesicles, uh, sometimes bullae, but mostly vesicles. So those are fluid filled cysts less than one centimeter. And they range from herpes viruses, the common chicken pox, um, shingles, introviruses, other pox viruses, and I'll mention some right at the end, we do see them. And then a number of bacterial infections, um, some more unusual ones, and then non-infectious causes. And we yesterday had a probable bullous pemphigoid sent to us as monkeypox. I'm learning lots of dermatology, I have to tell you. So here are some of the pictures. Um, I would say 95% of the cases that have been sent to us turn out to be chickenpox. They are um, often young patients who have um, the secular rashes. You will see that it's um, centripetal distribution. So it starts in the face, goes to the trunk and less so to, to the limbs. The lesions are very itchy. Uh, they're not painful. They don't often have lymph nodes. They often have lesions in the mouth, but so can monkeypox. Uh, there is a prodrome. But the important differential is there are many of them. Most of the monkeypox have small, uh, larger lesions, um, less in number, but they're at different stages of development. So you'll see papule, a vesicle, a scab um, in the same area, in the same patient at the same time. So this is overwhelmingly the number one diagnosis in patients sent to us. The epidemiology doesn't fit, but perhaps as the disease expands, that will change. Um, but they're itchy, and often they come covered in calamine lotion, the sort of traditional treatment um, our mummies did for uh, itchy chickenpox. We've had a couple of cases of zoster. Uh, mostly they're in a dermatomal distribution, not always. Um, and generally they're very painful. Itching is less common. Uh, monkeypox can also be pretty painful depending on where the lesion is, but the dermatomal distribution is quite classical. We had a group of children in Limpopo. Um, this caused a lot of anxiety, but the one parent insisted on monkeypox testing. Uh, the distribution of the lesions of, of the vesicles um, was, was typical. Um, mouth, palms, and soles, so hand, foot, and mouth. Um, most of the cases are a mild illness. They may have a mild fever. They're not usually painful. And um, when you get cluster, clusters of these, usually in, in creches, in young children, with the classical distribution, you know, the diagnosis is pretty obvious. Those have come our way. Whoops. Oh, dear. Um, lost. Pressed the wrong button. Sorry. Um, here we go. Okay, so um, let me just try and move this away. I don't know if it's here. Am I still there? Can you still hear me? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so this is cryptococcal infection. They're not really vesicles. They're more papules. They're found in, um, I think many of you are familiar with this, found in immunosuppressed patients but um, they do come our way because, you know, monkeypox is often a similar group in, in many uh, areas, but it, they're not vesicles. And often the serum crag is, is positive. Um, there we go. Uh, and then surprisingly, bullous impetigo due to staph has come our way, um, often a very erythematous base, um, transparent bullae, not really vesicles. Um, I think, you know, if you deal with pediatrics, I think you're familiar with these, but yeah, we'll be sent there. Molluscan contagiosum, um, I think you see a number of these. They're papules, they're not vesicles. They're often umbilicated, but monkeypox lesions can be too. Um, but um, these are not really vesicles, but they form part of the differential diagnosis. Other um, Sexually transmitted infections, um, 
may also uh, be part of the differential. And remember that some people may have co-infection. So uh, presence of STIs in people with monkeypox is, is not unusual. Um, so and many of the, the private labs are doing these um, STI screens uh, that can uh, give you um, results on you know, all the STIs um, while considering monkeypox as well. So this was a patient who had painful lesions and in fact the um, uh, PCR for herpes simplex was positive. But um, this one we did do monkeypox testing and it was negative. So it's not always easy. And these are in the genital area. So laboratory testing um, done, as I mentioned, in private labs, in at the NICD. Um, you need to call the NICD to discuss. Um, we try and um, really focus on those that have a clinical picture that's compatible and an epidemiological setting that, that, that really um, fits the current uh, picture of monkeypox. We don't want to do hand, foot and mouth children. So the best uh, lesion to take is a swab of the, um, the skin lesion, uh, the exudate, you can aspirate, you can do a swab, and um, that's, that's the one we really want. Don't put it into formulin, just send it to us. Uh, we don't really want plasma, we don't really want semen, um, serum, we haven't really looked for it. Semen has been tested in a number of, um, of laboratories not here. Um, some have found monkeypox, um, but the um, relationship to sexual, uh, you know, being a, a disease that's sexually transmitted, I think is not confirmed yet. So throat swabs, uh, rectal swabs, um, uh, but mostly skin lesions are, are what we've been dealing with. Turnaround time is about 48 hours, uh, depending on when we receive it. Um, but uh, it shouldn't really be one of those we, we do at midnight, like the Congo we're doing today. Um, so what about management? Um, for the most part, um, patients get better. Um, they don't require any specific treatment. Um, some require quite um, hectic analgesia, as mentioned for the rectal lesions. Um, but I think the whole process of being diagnosed and managed has been very traumatic. And this was re a report from a person who had monkeypox. It was reported in the Guardian towards the end of July. Perhaps things have got better now. Um, he had great difficulty accessing um, diagnostics. He waited a long time for his report. It wasn't shared in a sensitive way. Um, and uh, I think there are many lessons to learn from many of these personal accounts. So what are the options for treatment? Well, um, we have some drugs and most of the countermeasures are from smallpox. Um, and in the United States, they have developed uh, treatment options uh, really for smallpox. So Tecaviramat, uh, now marketed as Tpox, um, made by I think Sega, is an intravenous or oral preparation that was approved for the treatment in, uh, in, of smallpox by the FDA. They used what's known as an animal rule. Um, they didn't really have patients because smallpox was eradicated that they could test it on, but they did safety studies in humans. I think it was really in 2012 or something that these, this drug was um, approved. I stand corrected on the date. And uh, they applied the animal rule. So they did studies in animals using monkeypox. They obviously couldn't use smallpox, um, but they're all from the same orthopox group. So, you know, there's likely to be um, a response to, to this drug. But um, no RC, RTC studies. Um, they had planned one in the DRC a short while ago, uh, but it didn't happen. Um, and now they are undertaking a United States um, study, but remembering that um, the clades and the clinical disease um, in the non-endemic areas versus the endemic areas is, is quite different. Um, this was published, I think, yesterday uh, in the NEJM, giving um, a commentary and perspective on Tikavirumet for, uh, for management of 
um, the current outbreak. But obviously, you know, access to treatment, particularly in endemic areas where morbidity and mortality is much higher, um, uh, is important to consider. So what about vaccines? These were also um, smallpox vaccines, um, protective against uh, monkeypox. Um, they built up a stockpile really as a kind of response to potential uh, bio um, weapon use of, of smallpox and um, have continued to give it to some healthcare workers who are doing laboratory work, but also military personnel, as I've mentioned, and smallpox vaccines do provide cross protection against monkeypox. So some of us were vaccinated pre-1975, um, but the, the immunity and protection against smallpox is likely to have waned. So the original smallpox vaccine, they used a live vaccinia virus that is replicating a uh, second generation or more recent one is ACAM 4000, but it's not one that you can use. There's lots of supplies. It's made by Sanofi. Um, it did form the major part of the stockpile. I think, there were, um, I think the whole stockpile had been 1.7 million. Some of them are the more recent genius, genius, um, but lots of side effects. So um, you can uh, transmit the, uh, the vaccine virus to um, other people in your household. So you can't use it in a household where uh, there are those with uh, reduced immunity. Uh, you can't use it in areas where people have eczema because they may get infected and cause a lot of skin rashes, can also cause a myocarditis. So this is not one. That, that can be used in the current outbreak. Um, it's administered in um, using one of those, um, those like fork like prong things. I, I remember getting one and you had a, a scar uh, on your arm to show you'd had smallpox vaccine, but this is not for use and there's lots, lots available. The, um, the more recent one is um, Geneus. It's a live but non-replicating vaccine. Um, to prevent smallpox, it does provide uh, cross protection against monkeypox. Um, there's uh, limited studies, there's good reasonable animal data to show that it works against monkeypox. Um, and um, I think, you know, there's a gap in our um, knowledge about uh, uh, re it, its real efficacy, but it, 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 I think there's enough to support it, its use. So what sort of um, strategy has been recommended? Well, the first one was post-exposure to contacts um, who'd had contact with a confirmed or likely case of monkeypox. It was recommended that the um, like a ring vaccination be given within four days of uh, um, exposure. We know that that's a very difficult strategy. Identifying contacts is very difficult. In many cases, people don't know who they've had contact with, um, sexual contact in particular, um, and people don't want to come forward. And so there are long delays, there are delays in uh, laboratory confirmation. It's not really a, an easy strategy to apply, and does it work? We don't really know. So I think the focus now is on pre-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, again, um, will protect likely against more severe illness, um, efficacy unknown in outbreak control. Will it break the chain of transmission? Um, will it stop transmission? What sort of coverage is required? Um, target group at the moment would be um, the group that's having the highest number of infections, um, some healthcare workers, um, but at the moment uh, access is an issue the national stockpile is, is limited, and um, it's a small um, pharmaceutical group that, that produces it, Bavaria Nordic in, in Scandinavia, and upscaling has, um, has started, but uh, it remains a problem. Uh, access for those um, outside of the United States and Europe, well, there's a big blank there. Um, and, and really, um, that, that absolutely needs to be addressed. And that was one of the, uh, the reasons why the current disease was um, called a public health emergency to try and improve um, 
access to countermeasures, research on countermeasures, lots identifying gaps in research um, and uh, really upscaling. So, you know, providing these countermeasures for all address groups. So um, the uptake has been fairly good. In fact, um, many of the vaccine centers have, have run out. Um, the Genesis is the only one that is currently being used. It requires two doses, four weeks apart. It's a subcut, I think, um, vaccine and um, immunity is probably best about two weeks after the second dose. They're looking at perhaps, you know, like we did with, with COVID, um, certainly what we did with yellow fever when we had outbreaks, fractionation, so smaller doses, and then increasing the interval between the two doses, and then trying to upscale and outlicense the production of the vaccine. Equity, access in Africa, yeah, still a bit of a blank space. So uh, IPC, well, low mortality, significant morbidity, not easily spread. Uh, you need close direct contact with skin mucosal lesions, so not going to get it by being in the same room or uh, for a short time or shaking hands, I was asked this morning. You may find it in respiratory secretions. You certainly can find it in skin shedding. You may find it in fomites. These DNA viruses do hang around quite a long time. So um, bedding um, uh, would be, I think, quite important. No confirmation that there's sexual transmit transmission. And um, I think we don't know about asymptomatic transmission or transmission um, during the prodrome, but in patients without skin lesions. So those are some of the recommendations. And then I think finally, the, um, uh, the focus of public health control outside of vaccines and treatment um, to maybe reduce the shedding or whatever, we don't really know, is to identify cases and isolate for a period up to 21 days to do contact tracing. Um, problem is access to diagnostics until quite recently, the United States, which has the biggest outbreak outside of the endemic areas, had only four laboratories actually testing. And obviously that's gonna be upscaled. So lots of late misdiagnosis. Um, many patients have very few lesions. They may not even notice them. So ongoing transmission remains a problem rather than early isolation. And then I think importantly, ensure responses tackle stigma and discrimination, that we have appropriate and uh, correct communications and health promotion. The most recent one I saw, and um, I didn't want to show it, was um, one around the risks from, from meat and with a picture of T-bone steak and, and beans. So I think that came from the endemic area where you know, most people get infected from handling infected animals. It really doesn't apply um, in other parts of the world where the disease is not, ind not um, endemic. And I think it was really a, a pusher. And then there was a WHO meeting this, this week identifying knowledge gaps, uh, particularly around a vaccine and the search needed, and the list is, wrong, is long. So just in closing, I want to acknowledge a number of people, Jackie Vea and the staff who've done a fantastic job at the NICD Center for Emerging Zoonotic and Parasitic Diseases, um, the very dedicated Infectious Disease Society and Dermatology Group, who've responded very rapidly to suspected cases to try and confirm that this is most likely another infection and uh, we don't need to test and really um, uh, cause the, 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 the patients and staff great anxiety. And then the NICD clinical hotline doctors who've done a sterling job in uh, responding to the many, many inquiries. So in the last minute, um, I thought you could read this. Um, so there are lots of controversies and lots of areas to address in terms of sensitivities, stigmatization, um, and there's even talk about changing the, the name of, of monkeypox. Monkeys were, were not involved, it's, it's, it's rodents, and you know the monkeys were in a research lab, and um, that's where the, the name came from, but they, they have little to do with the, where this um, disease comes from. And so 
um, this is a letter from them, which I'll leave on at the end um, for you to read. Um, I think there's a group looking at um, changing names of, of viruses and making sure uh, we are sensitive to everyone's needs. So just the last case, Mark, if I've got a last um, few minutes, just want to remind you of other pox viruses, um, which do occur here. And just to bear them in mind when you are faced with this kind of patient and get good histories. And just as monkeypox, particularly in Africa, needs to be approached in a one health way, we need to look at other orthopox viruses or suspected ones in patients in a one health way. So this was a 50 year old uh, woman from Prince Albert. She um, was in a family of doctors, never a good thing. She developed this lesion on her finger. She, someone tried to incise it. She put some oil over it, hence the, the inflammation. And she sent it to her sister-in-law, who's, who's a doctor, and the brother-in-law. And they said, oh my goodness, uh, this could be anthrax. You better go to hospital immediately. This is very serious. Um, so she did go to hospital. She had to cross the mountain to, to George. She was admitted. The surgeon who saw her gave her some more antibiotics and then came to her and said, we'll have to cut it off or cut it out. And you can already see she's had one injury to her finger. She didn't want this. And I got the thing, I got the picture. And I knew her and I knew the background history. I did phone the, the vets in the area. We didn't know of anthrax in that area and they confirmed that. And I told her to actually to RHT from the hospital and go back to Prince Albert immediately because we thought we knew what it was. So the information is that she is a champion cheesemaker in Prince Albert. She works on her farm with very close contact with animals and um, kind of thought I knew what the diagnosis was. We asked for um, an impression smear and a bit of scab. It was the day of the big flags, but they got the specimen through the mailings court just before it closed. It came to NICD. Um, our wonderful Monica Burkhead, who runs the electron microscopy unit, was very excited. She immediately did some electron microscopy and confirmed it as a parapox virus, and uh, many of you are familiar with ORF. And um, in fact, uh, we know that's a different patient, very similar story. When uh, questioning her, she said her sheep and her goats had um, had all had had were infected with uh, the same virus, and I think it's called um, snot something or other. But you can see the lesions there. She did get better. She didn't need surgery. She absolutely didn't need antibiotics. And um, I think a one health approach to the diagnosis, knowing who she was, what she did, really um, with the clinical picture sent us in the right direction. So thank you very much. We've also had a Tana pox more recently, probably rodent um, source. And so we do get these from time to time. So that's the end of my story. I'm sure it's not the end of monkeypox um, and the outbreak. Thanks very much, Lucille, a wonderful talk. If you can stop um, sharing the screen um, and if okay. colleagues have um, questions, it would be great to to hear them, um, please just pop up your uh, hand if you're joining remotely. Um, I'm going to, if I can start, Lucille, uh, I mean, a wonderful talk, thank you, incredibly comprehensive and, and wonderful as always. Um, is there anything known about the duration of shedding in semen? Does it correlate with the last crusting of the lesions? Um, or is it possible that <laughs> could be a, a, a transition. Yeah, so as for other viruses like um, Ebola and Congo, um, there are sanctuary sites and virus can be found in semen for very prolonged periods. You know, I think Ebola, it's many, many months and transmission can occur even after an outbreak is finished. I don't think we know yet about monkeypox. I don't think we know even that it um, the can be a mode of transmission. I think finding it in semen is all we know at the moment. You know, others may, may know more, some of the virologists may have uh, more information, but at the moment, I think that's not known. 
I don't think the studies have been done in endemic areas. I stand to be corrected. And I think this outbreak is, is relatively new. So I guess that's going to be an area that we will learn a lot more about. And last, secondly, what, what, is, what discussions are being had with MSM populations in communities in South Africa? Yeah, I, I can't really, you know, um, I can't give lots of information. It's absolutely critical that um, communication and instructions and, re you know, um, recommendations come from the top down. It's absolutely critical that I think we learned from HIV that um, this needs to, to, the affected communities need to be involved. Um, through some of my colleagues, I know these are taking place. Um, number of the patients in um, other parts of the world were diagnosed in um, in SDI type clinics. So, you know, sharing information is very important with health professionals working in these areas. Um, but perhaps some of the others on the call will uh, be able to to highlight some of this. But I know there's there, there is a lot of information being shared. And uh, it's absolutely critical that this be done. Remember that anyone can get monkeypox. It just happens to be circulating in these um, sexual, social um, networks, but um, it, anybody can be infected if they have prolonged contact with somebody who's got skin lesions in particular. But let's, let's open it up and perhaps somebody else on the call could. Okay, thanks very much. So um, uh, I, I can't see. Sorry, I can't see your hands up in the IDA seminar room, Sean. Are there um, questions? Maybe a virologist can uh, can have a say. There are hands up, but there are virologists. Is <laughs> 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 there anyone who uh, make a comment or ask a question? So th there's a lot of communication at the moment within affected communities. And in fact, uh, one of the patients um, had consulted um, many of the special groups rather than formal medical care uh, in the period before he presented. And um, he presented very late. In fact, he was already better when he presented to his GP. Um, so there's, there's a lot of discussion, communication and information sharing. Um, and it's important that this happens. Right, Sean, somebody's got their hand up. Yeah, I, I, it's actually me. I mean, Lucille, thanks very much. I mean, that, that was a wonderful talk, a brilliant overview. It's talking a lot. I wanted to ask you, I mean, you've described how these, these groups exist in South Africa to screen out cases that are low risk of being positive. Um, but uh, I mean, and I, and I understand the need for that because you don't want to be overwhelmed with test reports. I mean, there must be a balance in terms of doing testing to understand prevalence of an outbreak, right? And so how do you, how do you think about that? So, you know, obviously it's to get information out to a very, diff, you know, a wide spectrum of health providers, including those who are doing um, clinics that, that may see more of uh, patients who present with sexual, STI type infections. So it's sharing of information, making tests available, um, and that's going to increase. Um, the access to that is, is increasing quite quickly as the private labs um, open um, their doors to, to testing. I think that's a good thing. Um, we haven't turned anybody away who insists on a test uh, for whatever reason. We, if we don't get a picture and we don't get a story and we get a specimen, we simply test. Not everybody wants a picture of their rash. But I can tell you that <laughs> the overwhelming number of cases, Sean, have clinically absolutely ticked every box for chickenpox. Um, they are classical chickenpox. Where we're not sure, and there are just a few lesions and they look like vesicles, and yes, they could be herpes, we test. There's any yeah. doubt we test. But you know, we shouldn't be testing what was two months ago very obvious to clinicians, chickenpox. And they, yeah. they are not atypical chickenpox, they are typical chickenpox. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, we've had we've had a cluster of cases. It's quite interesting since it's come since the monkey pox outbreak over the last few weeks of this thing yeah. in adults, mainly immunocompromised. And yeah. our, our approach supported by, by the virologist has been to because we've got access to quickly screen for zoster, and if that's negative, then send it for a monkey pox test. Yeah, just just remember that you can have um, herpes simplex plus monkey pox. So I think that's that's something we, we've learned um, that one doesn't exclude the other, but we have to look at the epidemiology. You know, five children in a crèche in Limpopo with lesions on their hand, foot, and mouth that are, you know, pretty obvious. That's that's hand, foot, and mouth. You shouldn't be doing that. But if there's any doubt, but that's coming our way. I mean, you know, they, these are obvious clinical diagnoses. If there's any doubt. We test. That's not a not an issue. So, a last uh, a last question from Sipo. It is difficult to hear um, in the from the room. So, can you just ensure you speak speak quite loudly? Uh, thanks, thanks, uh, for, for this presentation. So, I think my question kind of relates back to the the messaging for us in Africa in relating in relation to this outbreak that's happening sort of globally. And my sort of question and comment to you is whether we would sort of see the outbreak as it plays out uh, in, you know, in Europe, or would we be expecting something different? Um, I say this given the question of how should we be messaging in Africa? I, you know, it's a balance between saying that, you know, there are going to be high risk communities, but anyone can get it. And the question yeah. is for us here, um, should the message sort of be the same as what is sort of uh, happening in, in Europe and, and, and North America? So I think you raise a very important point. The focus has definitely been on the disease in the West. But the public health emergency um, was, you know, the wording was very, was very clear in the, the minutes and the commentary from, from the meeting is that it mustn't be seen as only a disease in the West. There is a large outbreak with high morbidity, significant mortality in West and um, Central Africa. And we can't just have countermeasures developed for um, the outbreak in, uh, in Europe and the United States. We absolutely must ensure that um, we do get a word in and that we do get access. So, you know, I think uh, the messaging hasn't been um, holistic and including inclusive of both outbreaks. And, you know, the numbers in, in Africa are increasing in those endemic areas. And that's being lost along the way. So absolutely right. Here, we could have both. We don't have endemic um, monkey pox, um, had very few cases, but we mustn't lose sight of um, what's happening a little further north. But yes, very important point. Thank you for raising that. Thank you. And as we as we've witnessed, I mean, clearly slightly well, some differences, quite a few differences in terms of transmission. But um, we have seen a rather large epidemic switch from MSM to the general population in South Africa mm -hmm. 20, 20 to thirty years ago, and it's not impossible yeah. that could happen again. So. Um, I think it's your your point is absolutely correct. I'm going to take a very very quick question from Cassandra, please, but it, it needs to be quick. We're at the top of the hour. Yes. It, hi, hi everyone. Thanks very much for Flumberg. Um, my question is more really of a comment uh, to say exactly about the communication. I mean, I was uh, I did a lecture with the undergrads the other day, and we were trying to work out. I mean, is it sexually transmitted or not? And I think just a point to make after everything we've learned in COVID and all of the vaccine issues and anti-vaxxers, um, the communication around this has been a little bit uncertain. And I think it's a, it's a challenge for us as an ID slash pathology community to make sure that we've got scientific information going out, but still that is decisive enough for the public not to get confused and, you know, to get, um, to feel that we, we're messing them around. So yeah, it's an interesting thing. So thank you very much for the talk. And yeah, for, so it's a that. very important, Cassandra. And in fact, on Thursday at, um, at UCT in the School of Public Health, I'm giving a talk in person, plus it'll be online, on the public health aspects of, of monkeypox 
and communication, access, equity, but particularly communication and responding appropriately given you know, HIV history uh, will be an important part of this discussion. So thank you very much.